today I'm going to show a couple of things the way I do them. Um, I'm going to do one of my, I consider it to be a little bit of a signature uh, wine stopper uh, in the shape of a, you choose to turn and drilling a hole. Um, my suggestion is when you use different kits from different manufacturers or Niles bottle stoppers, and pay real close attention to their recommended drill size because it does make a difference. Some are slightly bigger, some are slightly smaller. The threads that you'll use on wine stoppers, probably pretty consistent, but you can use the same approach when you're making handles. And I have a couple of uh, pizza cutters with turn handles over on the, uh, the show and tell table. This is a cautionary word. Make sure you use the right drill. And there's also a difference if you're using softwoods and hardwoods because hardwoods may require you to use a slightly larger drill bit to drill a hole. And those are all mentioned in the instructions that come with most of these kits. So the approach that I'm using for the stopper it's very similar to the approach that I use on turning any of the handles that I use on magnifying glasses, letter openers, pizza cutters, pie servers, those kinds of things. Same approach. I've learned that it's really, really convenient to use a threaded uh, mandrel similar to this. And the mandrel has a built-in bushing, but this can be changed. But the thread is what's important, and that thread has to match the thread of the insert that you put into the blank. And the blank, um, you need to use either uh, CA glue or epoxy, and I generally use epoxy. Uh, CA glue can be more brittle, and there's a little bit of twisting and ratcheting with a lot of these devices, and I would encourage you to use the epoxy and what I've also learned is to use at least a five minute epoxy. There are some fast curing epoxies that will cure in 90 seconds, but they don't, they don't hold nearly as well as the longer curing epoxies. So the question is why do I use inserts instead of tapping a hole in the wood? Uh, first of all, I'm not real experienced in other woodworking, so I haven't done much tapping of wood or metals for that matter. Uh, I don't own taps and dies. I haven't done that. Secondly, some of the woods would do very well. Hard and woods. The hardwoods would do well. Maybe some of the exotic woods would do well. But woods like this, where you have laminated layers, where they're kind of softer woods, Probably not so much. I think not so much. So I think the mandrel with the. All right. So. Now, that said, you certainly could put this into a chuck and chuck it, but I'd like to get the full use of the whole piece, and you'll see why when I turn the, uh, the mushroom for you tonight. Okay? So this is a one and a quarter eight thread. Fits nicely on this lathe. Fortunately, that's the lathe I use at home as well. But it's really just a mandrel that tells me that's the diameter that I want to use for turning the bottle stoppers. So I don't want to necessarily turn this any smaller than this diameter, unless I have some other plans or some design things that I want to use that smaller bushing size or a larger bushing size. Woodworking, it continues to evolve. And the adhesives that were available five years, 10 years ago, there are new ones out. Um, you can go crazy buying them all and trying them all. but. Talk to your fellow wood turners and friends, see what they're using, see what they like, see what works best, and then don't keep them for 10 years and then expect them to be, <laughs> it's kind of like finishes or paint, you know, glue as a shelf life. And uh, I always recommend getting, when it comes to CA or epoxy, get the smallest size uh, that you can get away with. Uh, you can get bigger containers, but you're going to waste a lot of it. Okay, so... Um, what I prefer to do when I turn just about anything is to bring up the tailstock with a live center. Do I need to do that? Is this big enough to cause a lot of vibration or, or a lot of flexing when I'm pressing against it? No. But I also have in mind that I've glued this in there, and could that glue break and could that come out? Sure. 
So I think it's a good idea to always uh, bring up the tailstock. I don't apply a lot of pressure to it. I lock it down. I turn the lathe on. And then I kind of manually start to spin that and I tighten it just so that it spins a little bit. That's enough pressure to give me comfort that it's holding that on. A little extra security for me. I'm not too worried about it splitting the piece. I'm not too worried about it leaving a big dimple in there because I'm gonna I'm gonna turn the top of that. And this is gonna be the top of the mushroom on this end, and this is gonna be the bottom of the mushroom on the, my my left, your right. Yes, Dave. The question was, how do I start before I start turning it? What do I do to prep the, the piece? And the nice thing is, a lot of these are available. They're cut to a standard size. I think this is one and a half by one and a half by two or so. And I just drill this on a drill press. I have a, a jig where I know that it's flush straight up and down, where it's, where it's not going to rotate when I drill it. And I mark the center. Uh, I actually mark the center of both sides. Uh, where I bring up that tailstock, I kind of look where the dot is. Um, and then I use the drill that's recommended. I drill it. A couple of things to keep in mind when you're drilling, they do recommend a certain depth. Pay attention to that. Um, they may say a quarter to one inch because the, the uh, thread will go into that hole. Uh, but you'll see as I pass these around, some of them are uh, aluminum or stainless, and some of them are brass. And some of them have a, uh, the, the thread itself has a flat bottom meaning when you push it into the epoxy, the epoxy doesn't come in through the hole, which is kind of good sometimes, but if it's a tight fit, it resists when you push it in the hole, it's pushing it back. When you put the insert in, the glue is pushing it back. So there are benefits to both ways. If you use the, the brass, which is like a little tube that you thread in or, or put in an epoxy in, the glue can come in through that tube and you may need to use a Dremel tool or something else to get a little bit of that out. It's not the end of the world either way. But I will caution you, it's better to have that insert a little bit below the surface, below this top surface, than to have it a little proud of the surface, because then you'll end up putting that on a belt sander or, or sanding it off, and then the stoppers may not go all the way in. You've shortened the insert, so the stopper may not go all the way in. Rather error with the, with the threaded insert being a little bit below this top surface, and then you'll be able to thread that uh, that stopper in there. Make sense? Because if it's if it's proud, you're either gonna you're gonna put it on there, and you're gonna have a gap between the the top of the stopper and and the um, and the piece of wood. You want to have the other. So. You might have to. I usually do push it up against my belt sander gently, but I don't want to shorten that tube. I might just want that surface to be flush, uh, recognizing that a lot of it's going to be turned away, but that middle three quarters of an inch, you want that to be as flat as possible. I have the blank, drill the hole, epoxy the insert in the blank, uh, chewed up the surface, that's really going to be on this side. This side, I'm not too worried about this being particularly flat because, as I said, that's going to be the top of my mushroom. And I'm going to turn that around and then I'm going to part off the little nub and take this away. Okay? Um, the tools that I use are pretty basic. So I have a small, it's kind of like a small little bowl gouge. It's pretty deep. This happens to be a crown tool. Um, I can use. And I know there are some folks in this room who will use uh, spindle roughing gouges because this is spindle work, right? Everything I'm going to be doing tonight is spindle turning, so you can use a spindle roughing gouge to, to do the roughing. This wood is laminated. It's glued together. I'm trying not to, to be too aggressive on it. I want to just kind of get the corners off, make it round, so I'm going to use a smaller tool. You can use a smaller uh, diameter bowl gouge if you want to. You can use easy wood tools if you want to. 
Um, I think, again, with laminated wood, the, the carbide tip tools are a little bit aggressive um, in the early stages of making ground. In my shop, I have lights everywhere. I also have fans everywhere. So I'm sweating bullets right now. I don't know how it is in your shop, but I am sweating like a dog up here. And part of it is I do like to have the dust blown away from where I am. And normally in my shop, I wear two things on my head. I wear this because it really does fit me pretty nice and snug, even with the beard. And it stays on my head and I don't have to adjust it very much. And I wear these protective lenses and these go over my, my glasses and they fit and they keep the dust not only from hitting my glasses but from getting around the glasses and in my eyes and it is a lot of fine dust and you're dealing with a lot of adhesive in between these layers on these little blanks. There's a lot of glue holding these layers together. Um, I'm not going to put that on because you won't hear me with that on um, but as I said, in my shop, I have that on all the time. I have dust collection in my shop. I have uh, 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 dust removal in my shop, and I have fans going constantly. I try to turn as fast as I'm comfortable, and with a piece this small, and with a sharp tool, and having worked with this wood quite a bit, I'm comfortable, it's around 2100 RPM. My tool rest is nice and close, and I'm just gonna simply round this off. I don't have this light on, but I think we should be okay. For now. now I'm using this ply, but you can certainly use any any wood or acrylic that you might have. Your tool selection might be dependent upon the kind of wood or material you're using. And in all cases, I just want it to be round before I do anything else. Okay. Just have a little bit of a flat here. Okay, sneak the tool rest up a little closer, raise it up a little bit. And please feel free to ask any questions along the way. Uh, the question is, um, using SpectraPly, do I offset it to get a different pattern? I really don't. I haven't turned it enough to to know where I would, it's kind of like ornamental turning. I haven't done enough of it so where I could actually get to something that I planned. I like to be surprised. And surprisingly enough, the way these turn, when I do put rounded, you know, rounded spaces as some of the ones that went around, they're really kind of cool. And if you use some kind of basic design concepts where your eye is looking at that stopper and, is, and you want to taper it a certain way. And a stopper that tapers one way or the other might be more appealing to your eye or the proportions. Uh, but SpectraPly kind of surprises you always in a positive way. I suppose the people who are cutting it, you know, are cutting it in a square. And so we're starting with a square so it's going to come out relatively predictable and not, not off by much. Okay. So, tomorrow. I should mention my plan this evening is to do this, start to finish. Maybe not finish, finish with finish, but basically the design and a touch with sandpaper and show it centered around. And then I'm going to do a little bit of a coloring and texturing that I do on some of uh, the trusty uh, spindle gouge. And usually 
um, if, if you're trying to do something, if it, you want to do a tree, you could just taper this from the base of the tree to the top of the tree. If you want to do something with uh, beads, large beads or balls or whatever, now's the time to take out your pencil and draw some lines and say, okay, I want to use this third and this third and this third for that design, whatever you want to do. So you've got a blank canvas at this point in time, use your ideas or just play around and see and you might be, might be pleasantly surprised. So what I usually do is I kind of approach it from both ends and then I blend it from the middle. So I know this, this end is going to be the bottom. Can you guys see this okay? This is going to be the bottom of my mushroom and so I want that to either taper or end up being rounded to so that the bottom diameter of the mushroom pretty much matches the, the diameter of this uh, mandrel. So I'm just going to kind of come at it around it. I may find that I will make the diameter of this bottom of the mushroom smaller later, but for now, I just want to kind of get it too much. All right, so then I, I'm pretty comfortable. I'm pretty comfortable with the, the proportions and the shape there as a starter. And I'll do something similar to that on the other side. Again, I'm around 2100 RPM. I'm using a sharp spindle gouge. And this is where all of those exercises where you're practicing how to do a bead come in handy. And this is where having sharp tools comes in handy. And this is where learning tool techniques from people like Dick Singh and others comes in handy. I've got my tool handle down pretty low. I've got my tool, the tip of the tool up pretty high. And now I'm coming off the edge, getting a little chipping from the, from the pressure fly. And I want to leave a little bit of a tenon there, not to hold anything, but when I remove that tenon later, I'm going to have a little bit of a hole in there, and I want to be able to get rid of that hole and not have to sand a whole bunch to get rid of the little hole. Okay, top of the mushroom, bottom of the mushroom. Now I have to decide how to shape the rest of the mushroom. A lot of different ways to approach it. I like to kind of come in from the bottom as if I was, again, doing the bottom half of a, of, uh, or the other side of a bead. And this is all going to go away. I tend to like to come in here and define how big I want that cap to be. As I said, I kind of work both sides. You guys see that okay? I like to make the bottom of the cap kind of straight. I like the way spectra ply turns. And at this point, 
proportions don't seem right to me. The, the cap seems big for the size of the bottom of the mushroom. So here's where I play around a little bit with the diameter of this, making it smaller. And I will say, for every mushroom you can make, there's probably a mushroom that looks like your mushroom somewhere. Uh, same thing with trees. If your tree doesn't look perfect, you can find a not so perfect tree somewhere too. So whatever is pleasing to your eye, from a, from a color standpoint or a proportion standpoint, All right. So the spectra ply kind of makes it look pretty cool without trying too hard. Question about centering it and things like that. Um, get a bigger dot on one side, maybe a smaller dot on the other side, but the wood will, will give you what you turn. If you turn it smaller, you could turn it down to the next level of color if that's something you wanted to do. If you were trying to have a, a, a gold la layer on the outside or get rid of that, we can play with that a little bit. I think the stem can be a little bit smaller. The lighting here is a little bit tougher, but I think we're going to live with that. Paul, why don't you have that tool turned over to 3 o'clock when you come around that beat? So why do I have the tool yes. turned over here? Roll it over like that. Three Can o'clock? I just keep it nice and straight? Well, I'm using this portion, mm -hmm. this portion of the tool right here to do the cutting as I get to the side here. And I am rubbing the bevel against this part of the... And what would happen if on that left wing caught a little bit of that? Well, if you have it in there. like this, it might be too much. I'm not going to give you the, no. the joy of watching me I think do that. Everybody but. understands what <laughs> happens to you. <laughs> you don't, don't roll it back too much. Yeah. So um, that's pretty much how I get to the shape. I do have a tool. And again, here is where you can use. Now, I mentioned earlier, can you use other tools to do this? Can you use uh, an easy wood um, tool? Absolutely. Um, but try it out on different woods. If I was using a really dense exotic wood, I might be able to get a better finish with that than I can with my spindle gouge. I don't know. So I, I, do, I do like the idea of having options. Um, I do have this tool, and I think it's actually called a mushroom tool. Uh, this is a crown tool. And I use this to kind of undercut the mushroom a little bit, the mushroom cap. And I want to raise that up. Since I'm scraping, and I want to raise my handle a little bit above center. I want the cutting tip at around center or slightly lower. 
and then I will use this to get underneath the cap. Right now, the, the bottom of the cap is a little proud of the, the straight line. But I want to come in. I'm kind of following the edge of the stem into the cap and I'm pulling that toward me. And again, depending on the species of mushroom, you can have caps with different designs underneath, different designs on top. Just a little bit of a feature where you can show folks that you were there. Okay? Um, at this point, I can start to sand. I won't slow the speed of the lathe down a little bit. I use the, this is, I believe, a 240. Yeah. I try to get in underneath that cap also. Just kind of blend in these spaces. So I could remove that little nub and remove the tailstock, but I am pressing on this wood a little bit, and it's it's holding on with a little threaded mandrel. I'd rather keep it up here and then just do a little finish work near the end. So I might do a little more of that at home. This is a 320. Not too much. I do like to sand as I am right now. Before I put the finish on, I'll sand with the grain so that if there's a little bit of blurring because of the circular motion of the sandpaper. Um, and I will say at home, I have a foot-powered air nozzle right here. And whenever I am between grits or sanding, I step on that foot power thing and I'm, and I'm always blowing the dust out between the layers. And that gives me, an, an, I'm not sanding the previous grit in with the current grit. And when I'm doing the finishing, I got a lot of the dust out of the pores. So when I put that, the deft lacquer in there, it kind of seals the pores. And then once that's on, it's pretty stable. It, there's not going to be. Um, and I have a bunch of them here in this little half log. Feel free to look at them. You know, there may be some slight uh, color blending. Um, so again, I would do a little bit more of this. I'd blow this out with the with the uh, with the air. Why smaller? So I usually put paper towel right there. I've got a magnet. I hold that there because again, I've got fans blowing in my shop all the time, and that would get blown off. The uh, this is uh, a gloss depth. I don't really pay attention to the fact that it's gloss or semi-gloss or, or not. I'm just putting this on, as I said, as kind of a, a sealer coat. And this kind of makes the colors pop. No oohs or ahs. Ooh, <laughs> Ooh ah. And I like to rotate it forward, backward, try to get it in every direction I can. It, take, it doesn't take long for it to dry, so I don't waste too much time on this. Could I have turned off that nub first? Yes. Normally I, I do that. I just wipe it off. And Frank, I think this color has probably got the most kind of bleed in it than, than I've seen on the others. It is kind of amazing because the different colors 
Some of them are actually a little denser than others. Some of them are softer than others. I, I don't know if it has something to do with the paint or the dye or whatever, but this one is uh, kind of blending in a little more than the others. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I just, as I said, I take a little piece of 4 aught steel wool. And a little bit of this uh, Birchwood Casey True Oil Gunstock Finish. I'm seeing it upside down and backwards, so hopefully you can see that. Where do you get that? Uh, you can get it everywhere. I think I got this at Ace. You can get it uh, at gun shops. You can get it at Walmart. You can get it at, uh, at Woodcraft. I like the smell of it. It's not too, too potent. Um, and like I said, it dries really nice. Again, I try to get this in there all over, and that's about it. And then I just wipe that off. This is a lot easier to wipe off than the, than the deft lacquer, because that deft is already half dry by the time I'm trying to wipe it off. But the steel wool and the oil kind of soften that up, and you get a really nice soft, smooth finish. Now I will just part this off. Like I said, I would have parted that off and sanded it um, before I did the finishing, but I wanted to get that to you. So I'm going to leave this here. I'm going to sneak up on that little nub because I wanted to get it. And I usually like the top of the mushrooms pretty much totally round. I've seen some that are a little swept up. Those are kind of nice too. But I'm going to try to just make this totally round. Lower my tool rest a little bit. And I'm just going to sneak up on this. I know the point of it is not all the way into the cap because I haven't pushed it in very far. So when I get down to about that, I will actually back the tip out and just kind of give it a little support with my fingers and finish that up. So if I'm at home, I just use the a couple of grits of sandpaper, use the, the two-step finish again, and I'll take this off. And there we are. There we are. So a number of folks have asked me about a couple of different tools that I use. Particularly, I'm working on uh, things like these Christmas trees. This was just a practice piece that I worked on this afternoon to refresh my memory on what I was doing. Um, and in this piece, I use uh, three different uh, beading tools. They're D-way beading tools. The, there's a large one, kind of a medium-sized one, and a small one here. I use the um, Wagner texturing tool to do the texturing in between the beads. Then I used a uh, skew just to put some lines to delineate around the texturing. Then I used um, metallic markers to get the different colors in there and highlight the texturing. And then when I get done, I usually just use uh, spray lacquer um, to keep the colors from rubbing off or you know, from when you handle it. And then I also use a, a four rod steel wool when things are nice and dry. And then also buff it with wax when it's done. 
So let's give this a quick try. So I start out with this. I turn it down to this, give it the general shape, and then I take out a ruler and I kind of, or just mentally look, you know, divide it in half and then half again and half again and break it down to segments. Um, and then I usually put the, bead, the beads in first. I use pencil lines and then I use the beads first. Um, and then I have the space in between the beads. I usually then put in the texturing. I then put in the, the lines on each side of the texturing. And then I do the coloring. So that the coloring will stay within those lines and not bleed over into the flat areas or even into the grooves. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of different kinds. Uh, I play with different ones. Lee, if you wouldn't mind passing those around. These are, these are called Art Performance Dual. I normally use brushes that, or uh, markers that have a brush tip. Um, and these have two tips. One is kind of a firm tip, and another one's more of a brush tip, because when it's spinning, it's, I put it on, I don't know, a few hundred RPMs, and I do it while it's spinning, and that way you can kind of put it on a little thinner, a little thicker, whatever you want to do. But, um, but the metallic, you know, you go to Dick Blicks or Blicks and go crazy. <laughs> I want them to be permanent, um, and uh, I've tried a few different ones. I've tried some that are not metallic, and I kind of like to look at the metallics on the trees. And on this, I also used a gold uh, on each side of the textured band. Uh, I did another one a while back and brought it here, and I used just a black Sharpie, and it gave it a completely different look. It was a good look, but, you know, depending on if you want it dark or, or gold. But my advice there is just play, you know. Markers aren't that expensive. So you basically start with your piece. This happens to be cherry. And you know every time you take a piece off your lathe or take it out of your chuck and you put it in another lathe or another chuck, it's not going to be perfectly centered. So I'm going to have to chew this up real quick. So in addition to truing it up, I can also start to taper it, and here's where, again, I brought up that tail stock, because I'm pretty far away from the chuck, and as I do this tree, I'm going to need that support at the very end. You can see where if you kind of do a lot of small things and concentrate for a while, it's kind of nice to rip through and rough something out for a while too. So I usually do bottle stoppers, handles and things and batches of half a dozen or a dozen. And I might do half a dozen or a dozen different trees. But right now I'm looking for a taper. I'm trying to get to fairly close to a finish size at the top of the tree. This is going to be the bottom of the tree. That's the top of the tree. Did you mention that root? This is cherry. I'm using a single roughing gouge. It's good to adjust that. This is one heck of a long the cherry is very dry. This is came probably from the same board that the one that was sent around earlier, or this one that had a nice 
cracked in it. But I tell you, I would not have not finished that because of the crack. I think the crack gives it some character. Um, sometimes there's a little knot or something else that you want to leave in there and distinguish it. All right, so I kind of get down to a where it's round, where it's true, and where I now have a pretty decent paper. I've done some trees that are like concave and some that are convex. This one I would say is more just pretty much straight. Uh, again, play around with it. For using texturing tools and things like that for this demo, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to have flats and straights rather than curves. I'm not using the ELF tool, but I have used an ELF tool where I create codes in the tree to give different textures. All right. What was the size of your initial blank? What's that? What was the size of your blank when you started? Uh, three by three by eight, I believe. I, you know, it's hard to get uh, dimensional wood like this in anything more than three by three. Yeah, this is three by three by eight. <laughs> so uh, at this point, I've got it roughed out. I usually take a pass with my skew. It, again, it doesn't have to be perfect, but I am using some texturing tools, and I want to kind of get some consistency there. So I just want a smooth surface. This tool rest is a little different from mine, so I can't quite get my hand underneath this one. Now you know why I brought up the tailstock, right? I'm pushing, applying a little bit of pressure, and I'm pretty good with that. At this point, I might also just take out a little <coughs> sandpaper just to keep the, the dimensions and the surface in check. Okay, so you get the idea. I'll probably spend another minute or two on that. All right. Here is where I determine my spacing. <laughs> pencil. Somebody in the pencil. I got a pen, Paul. Try that. Paul. Pencil. All right, so when you have this piece, now you want to decide how many segments you want or how many areas you want. I don't know, I just have to take my guess. All right, we're going to eyeball it. So, Say the bottom of my tree without the trunk is going to be about there. Let's just say that's half and that's half and a half. Sorry to all the engineers out there. Okay. 
I mentioned, these are V-Way beading tools. I'm going to use just two different sizes here. I'm going to alternate large, small, large, small. And you want to turn the speed down a little bit, but it doesn't have to be super slow either. I don't know if you can see the tip of that tool. So basically you have a, a, a hollowed out area. I'm going to apply that to the spinning wood. I'm going to put the left point on the, the left that line and the other point in an open area. And I'm going to apply some pressure and I'm just going to jiggle this a little bit left to right, right to left. And it's removing wood on the radius of that bead. And you want to do that until you don't see any flat on top of that. And that's, that's a pretty good bead. If I did that by hand with a spindle gouge, I could do that. It would take me a lot longer. Um, and I think for these types of things, this is a perfect application. I also use these tools on uh, spinning tops. This is the, the next size down. Same approach. I'm going to go back to the bigger one. So again, the design, uh, the design possibilities are endless. I believe this tool comes in five different diameters or radiuses. And I think it's dwaytools.com. But Easywood has uh, also bead cutting carbide tips. I have those. I have not tried them yet. That tool is difficult to sharpen. I'm sorry. I'm glad to have easy wood tools uh, with the paint thing, and I, I use it all the time. It's terrific. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Bob's question was, how do you sharpen these? Again, there's a there's one surface right here, which is the tool turned around. You use it in this orientation. You would surf. You would basically sharpen this surface. You can do that on a grinder. You can do that on a, a stone. Looks like this has a slight radius, so probably done on an eight-inch grinder. But that's the only surface you need to uh, sharpen. So big, small, big, small. So just keep in mind that the surface speed, as I get smaller on the tree, the surface speed is slower. So I just have to take a little bit more time, or I have to turn the speed up. I'm just going to take a little bit of time here. And you just jiggle it back and forth until you no longer see a flat on the top of that bead, and then you're done. This cherry is just uh, turning beautifully. I'm not sure if this would work as well on other woods, but it's really doing a nice job here on the cherry. And again, I didn't try to make this proportional to the diameter of the tree. Um, I would probably do that if I was going to make this as an art piece. And 
Pardon me? Have you tried this with Greenwood? I don't think I would. The question was, have I tried it on Greenwood? I don't think I would. It's like, you know, using a scraper on Greenwood. Probably wouldn't do it. I don't know, has anybody else done it? Has anybody else tried it? I would think it still have some flexibility possible, depending on where the wood came out of the log. If it's radical or no. nice and even, where's the pith? Number of questions, variables there. That's what I was wondering if that is a project that uh, would lend itself well to branches. Uh, can I get those markers back if they're buzzing around still? Okay, so these are the Wagner tools. Um, this one and this one are the same uh, pattern on the wheel. This one is just wider than this one. It's the exact same pattern. You can get into smaller spaces with this one and bigger spaces with this one. And this one is the same size as the other one I just showed you, but it has a kind of a larger pattern. Um, so depending on, on the, the uh, effect that you're looking for. Um, I'm going to use the smaller one because I went with bigger beads and I just want to have space on the side of it. So I'm coming in at about 500 RPM or, or a little below that. I've got the, the tool, the rotating part of the tool, hitting just about dead center. And I am, in a, in a sense, applying quite a bit of pressure because I'm kind of embossing the wood is what's happening here. Try not to have that tool skate. Five hundred is going to seem so slow. Five fifty-four. Let's do that. Okay. So I'm holding it down pretty tight to the tool rest. I'm. I've got the tool against me, and I've got it slightly angled so that I start the left corner first, and now I'm applying. It's skating a little bit. I'm going to turn that speed up a little bit. I have the tool rest back a little further because I have to have a flat surface and allow room for this to spin. If I had this too close, it would be grinding on top of the tool rest. So, same thing here. Hear the sound slowing down because of the surface speed. So I may just turn it up a little bit. I'm not going to press my luck on the top. All right. That was a little under a thousand RPM on the end. <laughs> okay. So then, as I said, the next step for me is just kind of defining the space around that texturing. And again, because I'm I'm doing this a little quick, I'm kind of slipping on some of these. So I'm just using the side of my little skew here. I'm just going to define this space and this space.
Okay. For some folks, you may want to take a little wire and you could you can burn in that slot. I've done that before. Um, I also would go in with my with my uh, spindle gouge and kind of bevel these a uh, little bit because there's a little rough edges from the from the beads. So again, I'm I'm doing this a little bit quicker than I would normally, but I wanted to get to the markers. On the table. And back here. Uh, so you have to decide. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So if we go blue, green, red, blue, green, red, blue. So you start with the blue and end with the blue. That kind of works, right? Well, would you stand in this I I I would. Uh, before I used any of those texturing tools, I would have sanded that a little bit more. But once I used the texturing tools, I would just use, I have a little brush that I would put over that just to get, and then I use the blower, air blower a lot to clear that out. Right now it's a little bit less than ideal. So now you turn this down. And I've got the markers. And I'm pointing them down, you know, down this direction. And I don't necessarily have to fill in all of the texture I just created. It just, I might want to do it light, or I might want to go back over it a couple of times. So I know every third one here is going to be blue, so I can do this. Here's where, when you're doing things quick, you can make a mistake real quick, too. Are you using the larger the small size of the pen? What's that? Are you using the larger the small size of the pen? I'm using the brush side, so the larger side of the pen. And, you know, I'm watching to see if it's covering. Um, you can see that's the... That's the blue. You could you could use the other side, but you'd have to press a little bit harder, and you'd probably ruin that tip, like on two rings. You know, wear it out. The felt would wear out. So there's a the green. There's the green. There's a red. And again, this these techniques, guys, you can use them on anything. You can use them on the outside rim of a bowl. You can use them on tops. You can use them on vessels, on lids of boxes and things like that. Just play around with it and play around with the different markers and bring your stuff in and show us, show us what you did. So that, you know, that could work. Um, and then, as I said, I kind of put, um, I have a black uh, marker that I'll put right on the edges of these. And so that kind of highlights the beads a little more, I think. And again, I'm doing this kind of quick. You putting those in the grooves where you had the skew? No, I'm putting them on either side of those grooves that I did with the skew. So between the skew mark and the bead on both sides of the textured piece. So I'm, I'm putting it here and here here and here. And that's what it, on this, this other one I used gold marker. Uh, and again, these are not perfect because I was doing it quick. But when you nail it and you get done with this,
And, and again, you go back a second coat. Right now, there's a lot of roughness in there because I didn't do the sanding and I didn't have the air blower on here and things like that. But you can see, did I pass that around? Um, you know, this one, it took a little bit more time. It's still, it was still pretty quick, but I was in my shop quick. But folks, thank you for your attention. Any questions on any of this, please stop by. My phone number is readily available. I'm usually around. If I can be of any help, uh, you need a mentoring session or, or whatever, um, please let me know. And share what you do, because that's how I've learned how to do all of this stuff. I didn't invent it. I didn't create it. I saw somebody else do it. There's some good stuff on YouTube. There's some, some uh, history in this room that have helped me. Um, but just try stuff. Take risks. Be creative. Have fun.